So we know how to project to a vector now. So the projection operator there is a a transpose divided by a transpose a, and that's it. That's the projection operator. Multiply any vector with this projection operator. That will project the vector that you're multiplying to a. Now let's talk about a subspace. Actually, if you think about it, projecting onto another vector a is the same as projecting onto the subspace defined by that vector a. So we saw that it's the same as projecting to the line defined by that vector a. And a would be the basis for that line. For that one dimensional subspace, you need only one vector to specify it. That would be a. So that's what uh, I've written down there. Projecting to a vector a is the same as projecting to a subspace s defined by a, which will be a subset of rn given that a is a member of rn. So basis for that subspace would be just a. Now suppose the subspace is not just a one dimensional subspace but an r dimensional sub subspace say r is 2. So how do you specify a subspace? So all you have to do is to specify the basis vectors. So in the case of r you have to specify r basis vectors that would define the subspace in rn and then we're hoping that we will be able to project onto that space. So of course when you're specifying a subspace using basis vectors the vectors will have to be linearly independent. That is a requirement of a vector to be a basis vector. But they don't have to be perpendicular or normalized. Now again, before actually going there, let's figure out why is it that we are actually trying to project to a subspace. So this is where the interesting part of the game starts. So if you have a set of linear equations ax equal to b and with uh, the number of columns much less than the number of rows, meaning it's a tall matrix, many more rows than columns. And that happens to be a typical case where you have a lot of data. Data would be a measurement of a, a bunch of features, as you will call them later, a bunch of features, but many, many, many measurements. So many more observations than the features typically. So if it is a facial recognition kind of data, typically you might have, I don't know, a 24 by 24 matrix or something. That would be 24 times 24 times maybe three or four as a number of uh, uh, different colors that you're using. And those would be the features. You will have thousand or ten thousand or hundred thousand different faces coming in, different measurements coming in. Those are all observations along these uh, finite number of uh, columns. Now, if you think of this data matrix as a as a coefficient matrix of uh, of uh, some equation, some set of linear equations, a x equal to b, a is a data matrix. Why you want to look at it that way will become clearer later. But it's a matrix. The moment you have a matrix, you can think of that as a as a part of a system of linear equations, then that system typically cannot be solved because you have more equations than variables, more rows than columns, and there is no guarantee that uh, all the observations are going to be consistent. In fact, it's almost guaranteed that they will not be because of measurement errors and statistical fluctuations. It is almost always the case that all the columns are going to be linearly independent. It's going to be a full column matrix because of noise and uh, independence of measurements and statistical fluctuations and all those things. So if you do the Gauss-Jordan elimination on A, you will get M minus N rows. That remember, M is a number of rows much greater than the number of columns. They will all be zeros and all of them will turn out to be non-zero on the constant side if you take one of the columns as the constants. So that is always the most likely scenario. So B is not going to be in the column space of A, which means you won't be able to solve it. So given such a situation, assuming that you want to solve this system, how will you do it? Now, you might think that, okay, you have M equations, M is much larger than uh, N. Just take only the first N of them and throw away the rest. That is not a good idea because even though the equations are not consistent, you don't know which one is correct. Or in general, none of them is really correct per se. All of them will have information content. So you don't want to throw away information. You want to use all of them, but you, you won't be able to solve. And in that case, in that case, since these equations do contain information and B is not a member of a column space, if we can project onto the column space, if we can find a B hat, which is in the column space, that will be the the vector that is closest to your constants vector in the column space. And that equation, that equation you will be able to solve. So if you say the best possible solution or the best approximation to the solution is x hat and that will be a x hat equal to b hat where b hat is guaranteed to be in the column space because you're projecting onto the columns. So this is the basic idea behind why you want to project it. I know that even now 
the motivation is not completely clear but because of the very nature of uh, the flow of uh, this particular lecture the motivation motivation can be clear only after you actually finish the lecture so stay with me so let me actually show you what's going to happen when you're projecting onto a subspace of uh, two dimensions in a three-dimensional space so you have r3 here xyz and you have a subspace which is a plane going through the origin so the subspace being a subspace will have to contain the origin and that is s how do you specify s you take any two linearly independent vectors in in the subspace s a1 and a2 not necessarily normalized nor orthogonal or anything just two vectors that are not combinations of each other meaning they are not one is not the multi scalar multiple of the other one the moment you have that and suppose you have another vector b this b is not in the the red subspace it's actually sticking out assume that it's coming towards you compared to the red subspace so it's not it's not on that plane so you want to find the vector that is closest to b in the the red subspace s so what you will do is you project b to a1 the the first uh, basis vector and also to a2 so that will be b1 hat and b2 hat and then suppose you add them up and now you look at the vector that is b hat defined by the addition of these uh, two projections if you look at that vector that is like the shadow of uh, b on the plane s and in particular if you take the error vector which is from the tip of uh, b hat to the tip of b e is going to be perpendicular to a1 and a2 because you constructed it that way you projected b to b1 hat and b2 hat and then you added them up so whatever is left will be perpendicular to the plane s in fact this is exactly what we did in uh, Graf Graf Schmidt when you wanted to go to the third column when you wanted to normalize you wanted to find the orthonormal third column in the matrix q this is exactly what you did you projected the existing vector onto the existing two uh, normalized q1 and q2 and then you subtracted it away to get the error vector and that we called we said that that was perpendicular to a1 and a2 or q1 and q2 in that case e is actually perpendicular to to a1 and a2 so if you move e to the origin that would be the vector because all vectors start from the origin so that will be the vector that is orthogonal to the plane s which means it's orthogonal to the basis vector. so this is what this is the projection that we want to want to do so let's take the subspace as a plane in r3 as we did s is a subset of r3 dimension of s is 2 as we saw and the basis is a1 and a2 a1 and a2 cannot be on the same line because basis vectors cannot be linearly dependent on each other so a1 is not a scalar multiple of a2 that is guaranteed because they are basis vectors now the vector b the projection b hat will be such that if b is already in the subspace then b hat is the same as b because the projection it, you take the shadow of uh, b by shining light on it perpendicular to s it is the shadow is going to be the vector itself because it's already on the plane so b hat is going to be on s if b is already on s if not b hat is going to be on s because that is the projection and b hat is going to be some linear combination of the basis and let's call the linear combination with x1 hat and x2 hat those are the scalar multiples that we need to multiply the basis vectors a1 and a2 such that you get b hat so let's start from there now if you take the error vector b minus b hat b hat that is the green error vector and what we are insisting is that that should be perpendicular to the subspace which means it has to be perpendicular to each one of the basis vectors if something is perpendicular or orthogonal i should say to a subspace it is orthogonal to each one of the basis vectors think of uh, the subspace as the xy plane and the only orthogonal vector that you can find to the xy plane is along uh, the z-axis or orthogonal vectors that you can find are along the z-axis and that is perpendicular to the basis vectors x direction and y direction so that is the nature of uh, orthogonality so again b is a1 and a2 some linear combinations with x1 hat and x2 hat as the scalars and if you were to write that as a matrix equation and if you put a1 and a2 as the columns of a matrix a and x1 hat and x2 hat as a vector x then you get our favorite equation b hat is equal to a x hat so a is a matrix the basis columns a i a1 and a2 in this case and b hat is the projection which is a linear combination of the columns of a because it's a linear combination of the basis vectors a1 and a2 and we just put those basis vectors 
in a matrix. So what that means is that B hat is one of the linear combinations of the columns of uh, A. That means B hat will have to be in the column space of A. So the projection vector is guaranteed to be in the column space of A.